congratulations um, on this film. I've been having a look at some of the things that they've sent through to me about the film, and it looks like it's going to be an absolutely amazing film. So congratulations. Thank you very much. It's been a real labor of love, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy with, with the results. Now, of course, I fell in love with your last film, My Pet Dinosaur. So tell us a little bit about your journey since then and how it led into this film. All right. Well, first of all, thanks for the kind words on that film. That was um, that was also another labour of love many years ago now. But um, this film, um, this film was born out of um, me actually having a break for a bit of time and and uh, being able to sort of come up with some new ideas. But um, this film is it, it's wondrous. There's a lot of wonder. And there's a lot of adventure, but there's also a much deeper level and a, a deeper layer that the film is operating on as well. So um, I'm really excited for people to see it. It's not it's not as it seems to be on the surface. Yeah, you've got such a creative mind when it comes to sitting down and and working on screenplays. Tell us a little bit about how this idea. Came, like with the armored pangolins and things like that. How did that all come about? Like, how do you come up with those ideas? Um, I was, I kind of had a, an image first of all for a creature that's in the film called the Luminaire, which is sort of a creatively anxious Tarsia. Um, I, I, funny enough, I, I think a lot of my creatures are inspired by what I see in the real world, and you know, amongst social groups and and. Also, my own reaction to things as well. There's a lot of there's a lot of me in in this film in terms of the um, in terms of some of the, the the things that our protagonist has to deal with. I mean, I'm not sure if uh, if you've had this experience, but uh, I've spoken to a few people who have where you know you'll you'll play these kind of games with yourself um, where you you know you might pick a target and if you can run there. At, in, in a, an allotted time frame, then, you know, it might help with some existential goal. You know what I mean? Yep, so yep. completely unrelated, but it, it, it's probably an anxiety type game. And I have heard that people have done this, you know, and um, it, it also, our protagonist has to sort of, he avoids cracks and there's a family situation going on where he, he has sort of withdrawn and, and has to explore uh, a whole lot of things there. So there's a lot of psychology behind this film. Definitely. Now, as you said, this was film was a labor of love. You're not working with a Hollywood budget. Tell us a little bit about how you plan for a film like this with a smallish budget and how much the black magic equipment helped you with that as well. Sure. Um, in terms of planning for a film like this, I actually really looked into the technology heavily, knowing that I wanted to create a vast um, underground world of, of creatures and, you know, there, there's talking animals and, and, and full 3D environments. Had I done this in my sort of traditional pipeline back when I was doing, you know, My Pet Dinosaur and, and the, the other films, this, this represents a, a seismic shift in the way um, it has been achieved. Uh, first and foremost, I knew on the effects end of things that I couldn't do things the way we had done in the past. So I started looking at the game engines at the time, which was, it was completely unheard of when I started looking into them. They were still game engines and their capabilities were interesting, but I kept, I kept coming back to the fact that I was looking at these games that were doing these incredibly um, complicated things in real time, like real time reflections and shadows. And I remember seeing like some sort of NASCAR game and thinking it looked incredibly realistic for what it was. And yet um, I was not able to achieve uh, anything in real time through my traditional tools. So I, I eventually settled on Unreal Engine and started playing around with it. And, and initially it looked pretty gamey still. And then mid-2018, when I was right um, right in the middle of the script, 
they came up with this ray, tr ray tracing, real-time ray tracing technology through NVIDIA. And then I knew that was it. So I, I adopted the, the entire Unreal Engine pipeline and we did a lot of research and development on how to sort of port our traditional tools over to it. Um, so that was step one in the process. Then when it came to um, shooting it on set, we w I really wanted to look at projecting um, what was happening in the Unreal Engine. But this was predating what had happened with Mandalorian and, and all the work that had been done in Industrial Light and Magic. And, I mean, volumes and LED screens are kind of ubiquitous these days with virtual production. We didn't have a budget for, for the, you know, the LED screens back then because that would have been prohibitively expensive. Plus, there were no... no turnkey solutions for that which there, there are now they're still very expensive but um so I, I looked at doing this ultra short throw projection system and um we did some tests with that and that really was very very interesting but the the issue we had was how do we balance the the light on the actors with the light on the screen? Because the, the ultra short throw projectors are wonderfully high resolution, but not as bright, no, nowhere near as bright as an LED screen. So we had this sort of delicate bal balancing act, and that's where the Blackmagic Cinema Camera came in. Like its low light capability in such a small package meant that I was able to get a few of these cameras on set to shoot different angles. So we essentially had two screens set up where we could get two different angles of the actors at the same time, which was fantastic. We sort of created a mini kind of half volume, if you want to, you know, sort of imagine it like that. And um, it meant that the kids had something that they could really look at, latch onto and, and feel that they're immersed in as well. So it was really, really important. So some kind of benefits almost as, as these big LED systems, but the, the Blackmagic cameras were then able to be so light sensitive that we could pretty much light the actors to match the, the, the luminance values of the screen. So that was really, really handy. Definitely. So how many um, Blackmagic cameras did you end up using um, for this? Three. Yep. Yeah, we had three. I mean, primarily it was two. It was, um, it was two 6Ks, but we had a 4K as well. Um, and we also... Uh, we did some green screen stuff, um, mainly as a backup to start with, but, I mean, when we got into... When we got into uh, edit, you know, a lot more of that came in. But what was wonderful about the Blackmagic camera was that with the... B raw codec, we're able to key hair perfectly and blonde hair perfectly that has been rim lit. Now that is traditionally a very very difficult thing to get a, a good key from, but you know there there are shots in the film where they're flying with bright sunlight, and that's that's on green screen and that has been, you know, it stands up really 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 well. So I was very impressed with the codec. Um, and then, of course, once you get into doing that kind of stuff, you're into edit and composite. Now, I mean, once again, when we started the process, DaVinci hadn't been used a lot for editing, um, but I could see the potential of just cutting out the, um, the round tripping that has traditionally happened. So on my previous films, I, I was cutting in Final Cut, and... Um, at the end of it, it was always a nightmare to get out to sound and get back out to colour and then get it all back again. It was just, it took weeks just to tag roles in in the audio editor so that Pro Tools could read it properly. It, it was a nightmare. So I wanted to cut that out. And also knowing too, with a film like this, with this much animation in it, things were going to be moving around right up to the last minute. So we're, we're actually delivering now. We've just been tech check from last week. And so I, that's where Da Vinci really, really shines because, you know, you, you can shift stuff with the audio already in place. 
if something moves around it, it's not hard to get in there and, and move a little bit of sound design around or add a little bit that's not working. Now, you know, it, it's just a really, really flexible system and the whole round tripping to other applications is completely gone. So that, that meant DaVinci was the hub. Now I did bring an editor on for this, Joseph Morris, and he was just, he was great, really great. I mean, he's got a, an ability to get in there, see a whole bunch of, things that don't exist and put together an entire scene that is co coherent as a, as a great blueprint for where we're going with it all. And um, once again, being in DaVinci helped me then be able to go straight out to Fusion um, as the, we used to standalone Fusion just for speed. And my word, that that is a very fast package, very, very fast. So, yeah, all in all, it was a, it's a black magic solution end to end except for the unreal engine stuff and um so it made it very 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 easy um and of course then mixing in 7.1.4 um uh dolby atmos has just been it's really simple you know everything's there now within the package to do a full production yep how have you seen the equipment that's available to indie filmmakers out there at an affordable price change over the years? I mean, I'm just returning back to, to film production after about 15 years away from it, and I'm noticing that there's things I can use now that um, just make things a lot easier, but there's things out there now that probably when I first started filmmaking was only available in Hollywood, and now they're available, you can just go and buy them at JB. Um how have you noticed oh, that change over the years? Oh, well, I mean, my first job was um, doing retouching on a, on a paint box type machine. It was called a document system. And that was a $500,000 US paint machine. Um, the entire, the computer took it up in the entire room and um, you can now do those things on your phone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that, that's how I've seen the evolution. Yeah, I started started back in 91 end of 91 doing computer graphics straight out of school and um mainly because i could drive a macintosh at the time like my parents brought home the first mac in in 84 and then when i got onto the got into the studio that um were interested in hiring me um, i was able to use the computers straight up and then of course that that studio bought this you know monstrosity of a retouching machine um and then, of course, you know, in terms of the filmmaking things, my first animation software I bought was called Electric Image, um, that was used on Terminator 2 to do the the destruction scene. None of none of the um, it didn't do any of the T1000 um, stuff, but it did the. There's a scene where Sarah Connor envisages the um, the destruction of the human race, and they used that. So I thought. Um, it would be a good idea to spend twelve thousand dollars <laughs> and go into debt for that software. And actually, it was a good idea because um, I think it paid itself off within the first three months. I, I got a gig on Quantum um, for the ABC, which is their science program at the time. That's now called Catalyst, of course. But um, and then it sort of snowballed from there. I just did you know documentary after documentary and ads and all sorts of things. So. Yeah, I've seen a lot of a lot of technological changes, and now, of course, we're we're in the new sort of revolution of AI at the moment, which is having some very exciting um, consequences. I mean, I, I think some devastating consequences for some people, but for me, I look at it and sort of embrace technology as much as possible, and I see it as another tool. Definitely. So, Matt, what would your advice be to all the young filmmakers out there that listen to this show? Uh, learn every aspect of filmmaking intimately. Uh, have a hands-on working knowledge of every aspect of it. That's, that's something that will allow you to take control of your own career. Um, that way, if you can... If you can finance something even by just, you know, saving and scraping together something, if you can, if you can do the majority of the stuff yourself, then you, you're going to be able to actually create a career for yourself. And then, of course, when you, you've got some experience behind you, you'll be able to, you know, uh, 
raise capital and, and, and get into much bigger projects as, you know, I've been able to do. But uh, it's a it's a wonderful journey. Um, it's a very solitary journey. So make sure that you have a very, very understanding partner. Um, I've been lucky that my wife is extremely understanding. But, um, you know, I, I think the, the cliche of the, the divorce director is, is there for a reason. I mean, you get yeah. very married to your work for a very long period of time. And I guess the big question before we go now is um, when can we expect to see Don't Go Below and where do you think the release will be? Um, well, it's opening in cinemas uh, in January here in Australia um, and it's uh, opening across every major capital city in the US. It's opening in the UK, Germany, Spain, um, a bunch of bunch of places around the world yes we've so we've got a, a very good release on this film um and yeah I'm, I'm looking forward to how the world receives it 